This week on Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, Windows Defender gets ported to Linux. April Fools! Just kidding. No, sorry, not 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 kidding at all. And the real story behind Project Sputnik revolves around a touchpad driver. Tech Republic would like you to use Linux, and they'll use every bone the news brings them to entice you. And the there's a new digital painting tool that's getting some Linux love, which, while proprietary, doesn't cost you both arms and a leg. Elementary releases a new update for Loki, and with that, it includes the new App Center. Uh, Ubuntu asks the community's opinion for the next version of Ubuntu about GNOME shell extensions and Windows control sites. Okay, well, um, we promised to get him to read them beforehand and not attack his mic. Next week, going right <laughs> into it, man. Elementary OS, Loki, not for one. It's out. It's brilliant. Yeah, so, I love it. So they, they've released a new version of uh, Loki. So basically, this is uh still the same base for the elementary os except that it's uh using everything available in ubuntu 16.04.2 so it will br ship with a newer kernel it ships with a uh, kernel 4.8 and other stuff are available in ubuntu lts but the major change with this ver uh, release is the new ad center which we talked about a few weeks ago Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, they had a Kickstarter for for this new app center, and the, the basics of this uh, app center is that people can publish their apps, and users can pay what they want for the, for the apps. So that seems like a cool idea. Uh, I registered to sign up for Nutris on the App Store, and I kind of stopped at uh, your your app app should respect elementary human interface guidelines so yeah, we're not <laughs> you're going to have to do yet. some ux work with that one <laughs> yes and we're, we're we're working on it we're working on it um listen man I, i'll be more than happy to help you with the ux because it <laughs> it, it, it it needs it man it does look like um uh, programming ux is what it looks like yeah. Uh, well, the the other thing, as uh, Strider already alluded to, is that if you're a third-party developer like, say, the creator of Lutris, you can now submit your app for approval on the uh, App Center for elementary OS, which is good. It lets people uh, put their stuff, which might not really fit into any major distro's uh, repos, but it could work just fine there. And... You get a chance to, if people really do like your stuff and they feel like kicking you a couple of shekels, you will get some. Well, I think it's a thing, man. It'll be interesting to sit back, relax, and try to figure out, well, not to figure out, to see how this experiment works out. But but on top of that, I mean, I really do want to say, kind of riddle me this. Why does it seem like every other distro is gosh darn heck bent? on trying to create their own app store lately. Oh, that seems to be the new thing. Did, did I just miss the memo? Oh, uh, I mean, it's been the thing for a long, long time. If we look back, we had the Ubuntu Software Center. That went well, didn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. But I guess people are trying to take the idea of the Ubuntu Software Center and implement it properly, I guess, to provide yeah. more functionality that people want. Shut up, Bird. Um, and I don't know. I honestly don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this seems all based around the uh, GNOME one because uh, the Ubuntu Software Center it went away in favor of the GNOME one with some patches. And it seems that most of them are based on that as well. I think the Solus Software Center is based on GNOME software. I'm not sure about the Ubuntu Mate boutique, but yeah, I mean, uh, they, they share some boutique. elements. From what I saw, at least from the the strings I translated, which admittedly I haven't translated all of them yet. Sorry, Martin. Uh, <laughs> it uh, it's actually it doesn't seem to be relying on the gnome stuff, mostly because otherwise that would have already been translated. Hmm. Okay, that's yeah. brilliant. Let's uh, talk about converting the filthy unwashed. Oh yeah. So Tech Republic they put out an article saying what a grip makes an easy case for Linux. Ransomware got you down. There's a solution that could save you from dealing with this issue ever again. That's right. It's Linux. 
Okay, so you don't deal with the malwares and the ransomwares and what have you, but you have to deal with supporting Linux on people who are too, uh, let's say, technologically illiterate to deal with Linux. And that is what this, well, they kind of do address it. They say nothing's perfect. Uh, there, but outside of the Linux specific issues, there is always going to be the whole shebang about having to support um, people who don't really know anything about their computer, how everything works, and they don't have to. They, it's just some people don't have to know that. They shouldn't have to. But there it is. And as far as I'm concerned, WannaCry makes as much of a case for Linux like uh, all the other security flaws that Windows ever had. Uh, people didn't change when Edward Snowden leaked the fact that Microsoft was uh, giving everyone's personal details to the NSA. They didn't change then, and chances are they won't change now. As much as it pains me to see, and it's still very much happening, Microsoft is holding end users and uh, user-facing enterprise systems hostage. Now, in all fairness, okay, this is going to be the first time I think I've ever defended Microsoft. Um <laughs> When the NSA leak came out, we're, don't worry, we're not going to rabbit hole this. Microsoft did walk out and go, effing seriously, you knew about this and you didn't tell us, right? So mm -hmm. I'm going to give them credit on that. But I, I saw a very interesting me diagram, a.k.a. a Venn diagram, which <laughs> had the two circles. It was um, people still running Windows XP. Yes, I know the majority wasn't XP. It was Windows 7. And people smart enough to pay a ransom in Bitcoin. And the, the circles were <laughs> no very far right from each other. Strider, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're talking about people who can't even keep up with Windows versions. I mean, if you if you run like a 15 year old OS like XP or even a seven year old OS like seven. I mean, are, are you even going to be interested in changing entirely your operating system? Nope. Uh, no, not, not at all. And, and those people, they are a real menace to society <laughs> because of that, because, because they, 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 they carry the, the disease. And I, I'm not necessarily talking about the end users there because, yeah, I mean, they, they don't, they have other things to do. I'm talking about the IT people who manage those installs because that's what happens most of the time. Yeah, but they, unfortunately, a lot of these IT people that manage those installs are their grandson, man. So I'm not, I'm not yeah. talking about families or like domestic installations. I'm talking about, like we've we've heard about stuff, real bad stuff happening in hospitals, in companies. Oh yes, and, hospitals. And you it, know, uh, let's uh, let's have the IT department request a system upgrade to the National Health Association. It's like, oh oh, what's that? It costs several million pounds, dollars, euros, whatever to upgrade to the new operating system. Uh, no. Well, I mean, yeah, even, I mean, especially when you throw it in medical equipment. All right, you're using Windows Embedded. I can never forgive you for that. But yeah. uh, you, you got to look through the approval process to get something pushed through. That's why a lot of this stuff is ancient. Plus, it is wicked, wicked expensive. But we don't want to spend too much time on this. That's not going to get solved. Be careful. Be very careful when you run out there and say, I'm going to convert someone to Linux from Windows and all that. And please do keep in mind... You know, just remember, kids, this is a free PSA. If you're going to convert someone, however you want to do it, you and you alone are responsible for their tech re support for life. Because we, we, we don't need those phone calls. You can't abandon them, man. It's like having a kid. Stick with it. Uh, this came out of nowhere. This is above my pay grade, but I wanted to put it in the show notes because it was a WTF mate. Uh, what's got a vast attack service? This comes from the register, like everything else in our show notes. Go check that out at linuxgamecast.com. Windows Defender. Yeah, somebody uh, ported the Windows Defender uh, to Linux, and they basically made a NIDS wrapper for DLLs. Uh, <laughs> so you can fuzz from Linux for fun and profit, question mark? Strider? Yeah. Help me out, man. Help this me out. This is yeah. I mean, this is quite a strange project because it's not. It's a bit like wine, but it's not like wine because it will only 
uh, load DLLs, like native DLLs from Windows, it, wo it won't re-implement any of the Windows API. Uh, so in that regard, it's different from Wine, and it won't run all full-fledged applications. Okay, I'm uh, looking here on the GitHub will... page. I mean, it's a distributed, scalable fuzzing. Windows can be, ch yeah, I can imagine. So is this something that you would deploy uh, I, from? I don't know what the use case for that is, but I'm sure there is one. I'm sure there is one, like being able to... I mean, uh, I get it in a way, because fuzzing, what it is, is basically going at a black box style software and just sending malformed or incomplete bits of input to see, basically poke at it with a stick until something breaks. And there you found an exploit. Oh, that, that's uh, so much better. All right. By the <laughs> way, don't look up fuzzing on Urban Dictionary. That's what I did. I, I'm going to have trouble <laughs> sleeping tonight. Uh, but uh, uh, Tavis Ormandy, uh, he actually ported Windows Defender to Linux. You can build it on Linux. Linux, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to Linux to uh, basically make his job slightly easier because as he says in the GitHub page, it's stupidly hard, annoying, and it's a very involved process to set up a fuzzing environment in Windows. So okay. doing it under Linux, apparently it's much easier. And he decided, you know what, let's just make an entire um, porting sort of uh, system whatever it is, uh, that can make Windows DLLs work in Linux. Now, for me, this kind of seems like going the long way around. Okay, sure, it's easier on Linux, but you are probably introducing more bugs and exploits, which would never be a problem with the native Windows version running natively in Windows. But, okay. I, I, I don't know. Uh, Somebody sent us some feedback on this one because I, I want to know explain it like I'm Vin. I mean, I could see doing this would before require, you know, spooling up a VM virtual workspace or something like that. Maybe, maybe this simplifies that business. I don't know. Do you, do you get any closing thoughts straight or it sounded like you had something there? Yeah. I mean, could we call it the Linux subsystem for windows? Because yes. That is but, not <laughs> uh, and I don't even know what it's supposed to be. Why haven't you sent him a pull request, man? I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's on GitHub. Just go. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. All right. So back into uh, Linuxy land. The fine folks behind Endless OS. We've covered Endless OS. It's a, a GNOME-based um, OS that is targeted at people uh, who want a Chrome OS-style experience, but with the full uh, Linux desktop functionality. Why would people want that? I don't know, but. There they are, and they are very much doing that. They also have, uh, I don't think it's these guys. I'm not sure anymore, so I'll just drop it there. Um, the thing that they did this week was uh, they grabbed Steam, put it in a flat pack, and now provide it on Endless OS. So yes, if you are running Endless OS, I'm sorry, uh, but you, if you install Steam, it comes in a flat pack. And so long as they keep the runtime... Uh, in its own folder and it gets picked up by the LD library path variable. I don't see how this could affect game functionality or, or anything. But then again, and then I started thinking and actually looking at the Steam packages that you see for most distros, Ubuntu, Fedoras, what have you. The Steam package itself is usually just a binary, a couple other stuff. Doesn't come with the actual Steam client or anything. It's the moment you start that binary, it downloads the Steam client, downloads those updates, downloads the runtime. Then you get the Steam client in your .local share Steam or simply uh, .steam folder. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see why it wouldn't work, even if the, the Flatpak can properly translate uh, like every OpenGL call and everything like to the uh, to it's Steam. not doing that the runtime doesn't do that yeah no but the, the it needs the, the flat pack needs to access the OpenGL driver i know that was an issue with uh snaps i think with krita or something like this uh yeah i don't see this being an issue here uh maybe the only issue it could cause is like if you were looking for your saves 
in this environment, this confined environment, you might have some trouble like like finding your actual uh, safe games. Well, they do say um, if you want to try it, go have ad. Uh, that's why we're covering it. It's not necessarily gaming. It's somebody shoved Steve in it. We want to know how it works. And apparently it does. They've had some bugs. They said you might want to update recently because they initially, after the initial push out, had some issues. But, mm -hmm. um, hey, man, it, Firefox 55. It won't die. It, it, it'll it never die, die because you know what? Flash will become asked to activate for everyone as opposed to nuked from orbit which it should be um yeah man starting with the release of 55 adobe flash plugin for firefox will be as set to ask to activate by default um yeah that's all part of mozilla's plans to move away from those np api well plugins built around the how can i abbreviate that i love trying to enunciate abbreviations it's and poppy <laughs> um, yeah, puppy. <laughs> so yeah i i just hope flash dies uh like a horrible 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 death and then again it's 2017 pedro why why has my wish not come true honestly i would very much like to know that as well just kill it let it die seriously what is holding everyone up just i can't honestly think of a website that i've been to over the past year maybe even more than that, that absolutely required Flash. Mm -hmm. I have, and I, and I yeah, if, if you, if remember, if you I don't run Flash, then you don't get to run Flash because that's how we are. Like you only can run Flash if we tell you you can. Oh, no, okay, no, Mr. He, he thinks he has a very clever statement. They replace Flash with real player and then see how clever that looks. Same thing, same thing, same thing. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm under the impression that we've to, uh, talked about this very same story, like so many times now. Like, just wanting. Yes, and we will keep and... hammering that button until someone does. Well, we're talking kill about Flash. different stories and different things that are going on, but they just happen to concern Flash. And hey, man, people might load up and somehow listen. If you know a web zone that you reg regularly visit that uses flash you probably shouldn't be going there in the first place okay that's just a life mm -hmm. pro tip like my flash doesn't work and i guess it'll act activate I, I i really sit back and thought because this really comes to a head on android mobile using chrome because i when they said flash is not going to be a thing on android you had to use dolphin with a flash plug in and they had like flash firefox with flash built in from another company nowadays don't even think twice about it because it's not a thing. But um, check this out. This is a thing, the big thing. How Dell's Project Sputnik came to life. We've kind of mentioned over this before, but um, uh, Swapno? Swapno? Swapno, yeah. I'm going to go for that, man. He, he got to sit down and talk to Martin George, uh, the project's initiator and lead to understand the backstory. It was definitely kind of surreal because he plus one one of my tweets today. Uh, humble brag. But no, this just goes back to billions of years ago in the future, about 2011. And just when he was part of the Dell team, how it started out, they were, uh, it wasn't a big thing. He found out about a small project that, well, uh, what would you call it? Like a grant at Dell for 100,000 wet stinky caches to innovate and do stuff like that. He got that, pulled a bunch of part time team members together and uh, got some laptops, figured out what was going on. They got everything up and running except for a touchpad. Apparently, that took a lot of work. Uh, yeah, it was six months to see. They, they had six months to see if the idea of a developer laptop, because this wasn't really going to be consumer. You might remember way back and then you, you had to do some cryptic massaging of Dell's web zone in order to order a Linux laptop. It wasn't just straight there, boom, and do it. Uh, yeah, they had six months to see if that laptop would fly and become a real product. It did. One of the smartest decisions Dell ever made. Uh, Strider, I, I think the author might, might, might have m messed something up with um, the timeline, it's, with the distribution, yeah, maybe. So, so he writes, he writes uh, Dell had been offering Ubuntu since the late 90s. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like that a lot. This, Dell has shipped Ubuntu before Ubuntu existed. That is awesome. Um, yeah, this, but anyway, it does, does show something is 
there is a demand for Linux laptops and it's viable commercially. So maybe other OEMs should take a hint about this, you know, like the Lenovo and Asus. You should see, okay, maybe we could start shipping with Linux. Could be a good idea. And yeah, I mean, I would like to buy a, a Linux ZenBook from Asus or <laughs> maybe a ThinkPad. That would be a very good thing. Pedro, what do you think the market really is in 2017? Because let's say 2004, you really had to pick and choose which laptop you were going to throw Linux on because, you know, yeah. if, you, if you had 95% of everything working, you were doing good. Um, 2017, I mean, unless you're throwing Hannah Montana Linux on something, pretty much hey, everything, even, uh, then, everything's going to work out of the box. So when we're looking at boutique things like System76 or Dell or, well, really those two. Well, um, uh, yeah, the, you see, System76 is more boutique style stuff while Dell focuses more on the enterprise style laptops. You could as a, an end user still get and that's what the XPS line is there for. It's, if you're a developer you are not you don't exactly have access to enterprise money. So you buy yourself an XPS 13 or an XPS 15 and they say, uh, Martin George actually in the inter interview said that year over year they double their sales of their Linux laptops. Double! That's insane. And uh, according to him, uh, they had six months after they were approved to um, come out with a functional laptop. They did. Uh, it took them a total of seven months from the initial presentation to uh, the uh, board of directors at Dell uh, to actually coming out with a product to the market. And at first he wanted to do like a full lineup between Svelte laptops, workstations, desktops, everything. And someone at Dell said, no, you will focus on one laptop and one laptop alone and you will do it right. And he did. That was the XPS 13 at the time. Now you get the XPS 15. You have the Precision's uh, workstation laptops. And you also have a Precision 27-inch uh, all-in-one desktop. So apparently they're doing real good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just, there's just one thing I don't really like about how they, they sell those XPS 13 is that if you go to the main page for the XPS, the one with Windows, you won't have the option to put Linux on it. You have to look for XPS Developer Edition. Mm -hmm. And only there you can have... Yes, but you know why that is? Because Microsoft walked in, wrote a check, and said, make it like this. Mm -hmm. Yep. So <laughs> there's that. Uh Hey, man. Right. Um, yeah, our Theron kind of pointed this out uh, to us early on. What's it about? Paintstorm? Indeed. So uh, this is Paintstorm Studio. It's a professional digital painting software. And there was a little bit of a uh, forum post from users saying, uh, hey, guys, just wanted to know, will Paintstorm be released for Linux in the future? And the uh, support person said, like, Linux version is in our plans, but again, promise that it will be released very soon. And then a couple of days later, he updated the um, the post. Well, not a couple of days later, a couple of years later, <laughs> uh, he updated the post, and there it is. Uh, there is the Linux version 2.0 is now available from that post in our show notes, and I got a chance to try it. The the trial version is free, and like, okay, let's use the trial version. That's that picture Vince showing you there. I uh, borrowed the <laughs> a drawing tablet I bought for Nori a few years ago, but yeah, it works. And uh, yeah, it's uh, there's one thing that didn't work that Strider actually brought up in the uh, in the notes, which is the pressure at the tip of the pen. It's not working in um, Paintstorm Studio, uh, but it is working in GIMP, so it's not a system issue. It's a Paintstorm Studio issue. Something I'm so, definitely curious about, Strider, is why should I pick this up over, let's say, Tux Paint? Oh, Tux Paint, I mean, that's just something kids would use, but I mean, this is more of a direct Oosh. competitor to My Paint or Krita, both of which are really good. So this one, like the uh, Paintstorm Studio, has to be very, very good in order to compete with like those those painting programs. I've tried it and it seems to be 
quite decent in, indeed. Uh, I didn't have the, the hardware to test with the, the tablets and all that, all that stuff. Uh, according to the, the forums, it seems to be hit or miss. Some people have, have had success, especially I think with the Wacom's tablets. Mm -hmm. With the other brands, maybe not so much. Uh, yeah, that said, if, if it does work with your tablets, and you have the demo to try it out. It's yeah. not that expensive. It's like twenty bucks for the a lifetime license. So it's twenty bucks for one seat, but it's a, a lifetime license. And mm -hmm. the trial version uh, lets you start it up thirty times before it dopes itself until you find the uh, configuration folder, nuke it, put in a new email address, and oh look, thirty more <laughs> activations. Wow, that, that's just <laughs> definitely a company going. Meh, I mean, it's there. I mean, it, but what I'm kind of interested in, Pedro, is. I remember the first time I like plugged in this Bluetooth adapter into a Linux box and it just worked. I was like, Whoa, mm -hmm. what? I was waiting for the lightning because things aren't supposed to... I was genuinely kind of depressed because I was looking forward to spending the evening getting it working. <laughs> like, And I'm not joking. I'm not knocking Linux. This is part of the fun because you learn six new things. What was it like plugging Nori's tablet into your... Um, box what was it just straight it's, uh, well on my box uh, since i'm not using a gtk based desktop environment i don't have the little wacom settings thing in the control center so uh, uh i'm currently running kde because i'm stubborn like that uh so i looked up on github and everywhere else to see if i could find a kde wacom configuration gui so i wouldn't have to use the x set wacom driver uh tool mm -hmm. from the terminal because you could still totally do everything from the terminal, but it's amazing how much that particular GUI, I can't remember what it's called, I'll update the show notes uh, and leave a link to it. But it does actually do everything, it lets you configure a bunch of different stuff. The, the, you can set the pressure curve on the tip of the pen, you can set everything else, but unfortunately, at least with that tablet, it didn't work with uh, PaintStorm Studio, so... Hmm. Okay, yeah. um, wrapping this up with some delicious Ubuntu goodness. Yeah, and this is going from the desktop team uh, at uh, Ubuntu, and they have a few questions for the community uh, about the future uh, 17 or 10 release, which will be shipping with a GNOME shell by default. And they want to know which extensions should this ship? I mean, which ones are useful? Uh, which which extensions are not that useful? And yeah, they had the survey, which is over by now, but they, they had the survey about on a scale of one to, to five, how useful are, are those extensions? Uh, those are mostly extensions I use myself. So I'd say, yeah, they're pretty much a good choice. Uh, I would have had it uh, Workspace Grid as one of them because that's the extension that, that made me switch to Dome Shell. But other than that, I mean, it's it's pretty same uh, set of extensions. So you have uh, Dash to Dark, which is a very good one. Uh, Alternate Tab, which is always pretty good. Uh, some things to set up your application menu, the volume indicator, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and also brought back the question of which side should the Windows control should go <laughs> and which should always be left. Left is where you want to have your Windows controls. If you're a Unity user, or you were a Unity user before it died, because that was a good idea, wasn't it, Canonical? Yes. Well, it's... Uh... It's Ubuntu, at least for once, instead of doing something, they're actually coming out to the community and say, it's like, okay, we want to do this, so how do you think we uh, would be the best way to do it? So that's progress, I guess? Well, yeah. I mean, listen, we just threw, threw this in here because we, we want some feedback um, from you lot. You know, if you did take this Pepsi challenge, and if so, what and why did you vote for? I saw some interesting things flow through um, IRC and Chat Realm. Uh, 
maybe a widget or a plugin or something that'll let you one click install XFC for that. That would really be the only thing I could think <laughs> about, but it was kind of interesting what you just said, Pedro, because maybe they'll take the gnome approach of um, having surveys of like what the users think and still doing it exactly however they wanted. To do it. <laughs> yeah. Like just uh, going out and doing it however they want. Anyway, I honestly don't know, but Hey, it's, I don't, I don't like gnome. I don't, I just, don't I used to like GNOME 2, but uh, GNOME 3 just doesn't uh, just doesn't really work for me. Use uh, whatever you want. It's brilliant as long as it works for you. But yeah. um, there, there's some beautiful people that allow us to do whatever we want anyway. Yep. And they throw us monies. And if you'd like to throw us some monies, you can go to LinuxGameCast.com. Support. Hit. There's a little support button at the top. And you get all the options uh, with which you can throw a little bit of wet stinkies at our heads that's bound to do some damage at some point. We have our Patreon, that's patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast, which uh, Mr. Mango, sir, uh, decided to increase his pledge. Thank you very much. That's and awesome. we also have uh, Obi Wike Nwoki. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce that. And uh, You get Texas. two points just for attempting that. <laughs> that's what it's, it's Obi Ike Nwoki. I was going to ask Strider to say Obi Ike no Woki, but he would implode. So <laughs> Obi Ike and Woki, <laughs> he tried. Okay, an effort he, was he made. Did. And you also get uh, if you don't like Patreon, like these awesome wait, wait, people. Wait, 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 wait. I'm seeing another name in there, man. There's another name in there. Oh, Caxus. Yes, indeed. Uh, Caxus also threw some wet sticky caches at our Patreon. Thank you very much. Uh, so if Patreon's not your thing and you just do a lot of Amazon shopping, there are some Amazon affiliate links for Amazon UK, Amazon US, Amazon Canada, and Amazon France. No Spain, no Australia. Wait a minute, Pedro, but, but, uh, is this Amazon affiliate? Pro is that something I gotta like sign up for? No, 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 no. no. You, all you need is to shop through Amazon. Just click on that button. It'll take you right to the Amazon front page with our little uh, affiliate code already at the top bar. So when your purchase is finalized, we get monies and it doesn't cost you anything extra Pretty sweet. at all. All right. And to close that out, we, we, we have this newfangled thing called Bitcoin. It's going oh, nowhere. Yes. So if you have hundreds of them just laying around, just send them to us because we can convert them into this new studio thing we're trying to put together. And thanks to everyone. Currently joining us live, I see Steve floating around and all the other beautiful people because there's just too many to name. It's awesome. Oh, Discord, check this business out. That's yes. the thing. Doc, I see Doc. He's in here right now. That is where the 60 plus Patreons hang out. The inmates hang out there the other six days a week when we're not doing this show. It's kind of brilliant. Thanks for your support. We are wholly listener supported so no ads and you make it yes. possible it's brilliant but let's nom on some pie before we get out of here mm -hmm. indeed so uh what's this energy no no this is a shocking story Ooh. it is uh, uh, strider's like oh it's a le legit project man this is making a power monitor with what did he oh the, this company started out with the original buy but they've since worked their way up and they make all types of stuff man they have a web interface that you can monitor it on oh check that out uh, humidity temperature sensors this this is kind of cool all right uh imagine if you took a kilowatt and made it do a lot more stuff, but you got to build it yourself. I mean, I, I could see this project being useful for people who were trying to get off the grid. Say, you know, you, you had solar or an aqua reactor and you wanted to monitor energy usage and build something cool. And it's completely open source. So check it out in the notes. It's kind of hard to describe. Uh, I, I got to say for everything else, you know, I, I have a kilovolt. You put that on and it tells you what's going on. Plus... Most EMCs and power companies, at least here in the States, I've discovered, um, go to their web zone and it'll kind of show you day to day. And he's like, I don't know it'll if I have you that. The Trust kilowatt me. counts, yeah. You do. Strider, explain this for the people, man. This is confusing. Yeah, I mean, that that seems to be a really cool um, like energy monitoring tool. And they did it the right way because we often uh, talk about projects on the segment Slice of Pi, which don't really require a pie at all uh, but this time they, they, they started with 
using Arduinos and they say, okay, with an Arduino, we're not going to be able to put a web server on the appliance. And then they went full the Raspberry Pi and they, they could like fit the web server, they could fit everything. So this is a very legit use of a Pi and for a useful products for change. Yeah, and good. it's also good for those companies uh, that are looking to minimize their carbon footprint. They also uh, are very keen to mention that in this article. Uh, say you want to keep your server farm about as efficient as it could possibly get, you can use this to get some readings. That's good. That's that's just a really good idea. Hmm. Well, yeah. um, if you're looking for a deal to pick one of these... Uh well, to build one of those, because it's all open source if you don't want to buy it directly. Uh, it's just from Adafruit. Awesome little company. I've ordered from them a couple of times. Uh, the Pi Z uh, 1.3 camera packs now include a Pi Z 1.3. So th this doesn't come with the Wi-Fi's, though, does it? Nope. Mm -hmm. No, th this is the, the classic uh, Pi Zero. And uh, how much is it? It's, it's, uh I think it's thirty nine dollars for the the whole pack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for for yep. for five bucks more, you could have the Pi Zero W with the Wi Fi and Bluetooth. So, and this is probably you might want to pick up the one with Wi Fi. Uh, might be a better because otherwise you won't, you don't have any connectivity on this one. You don't have Ethernet. You don't have Wi Fi. So that's a bit of a problem, I guess. Well, it's a camera. You just. Uh... It's a but camera a, uh, that you want, <laughs> you want a, to get back uh, the photos. Yeah, you have to set it up so it dumps the um, the, the pictures and everything else into the uh, micro SD, and you just pull the micro SD in and out as you need it. Well, even that, man. I mean, if you're building a camera with a Raspi, you're probably doing it more as a project, as it was like, ooh, new yeah. camera. <laughs> Really? I mean, even the uh, camera lenses that they have, they have several different ones, but they do have a um, an 8 megapixel regular camera, and they have a no IR megapixel camera, which uh, does have a really good sensor. No, so no. If I, I kind of want to get crazy now. This is why we need a budget, because I want to build an adapter ring for um, some of my long glass for my Nikon. <laughs> we can sit there with a big massive lens on it at something. That... <laughs> that that would require a lot of doing, though. But yeah, it should be possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It'll be brilliant. Yeah, save yourself some money. Go check that out. Um, hey, we got to leave you, but we want to love you right quick. Uh, if you want to talk to us, hit the contact button. That's kind of brilliant. We had a couple of things that we definitely want you to get back to us with that we discussed during the show this week. Just check out LGC Weekly or Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays. Do it. Answer the ultimate maths question in the universe. Send it there. <laughs> Yeah, we get back to everyone. Now, not everything makes it on the show. Sorry, but we definitely get back. We're like, mm, you know, I'll write you back myself. Or you can leave a comment on YouTube. There's not 100% guaranteed. If you kind of want some guaranteed stuff, leave a message under the post on Patreon. That's going to get on the show because we like loving you back that way. Coming up, um, well, we only had just a little bit. Actually, man, this is about last week. All right. Yes. <laughs> so uh, Jason says, in the last episode of LWDW, Pedro talked about how he, uh, a viewer could understand him better than Ben, even though he speaks with a Portuguese accent. No, I don't. Portuguese accent sounds horrible. Uh, this uh, led to Matthew, a.k.a. Strikor, uh, discussing how Ben has created a distinct language for himself. So I guess you could say he was, um, he had a certain je ne sais quoi, Strider? Baguette <laughs> at white flag yes. with arms open. I... <laughs> uh, yeah, except less less French and uh, more uh, more everything else. Yeah. And okay. <laughs> not not in, in not including like French bits. Including the That's French what... bits? I I don't know. There, there was quite a the um, discussion thing. I don't know. I think everyone's understandable. I mean, you you can definitely understand Matthew if you listen to him for a little bit. And Pedro, Pedro apparently sounds like he's English, not well American English, I believe. Uh, generic American accent. Mm. So, so, so you <laughs> I had an American person. It's like, which city are you from? I'm not Kansas. What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but you, your English is really good. That's debatable. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, everyone English is good or well. I, I, I don't know. I'm more of a grammar type person when it comes to reading and writing and all that. Anyway, uh, English back at us next week with some cool stuff so we, we can talk about it. It will be terrifying. But it's going to do it for the show. It's been fun. It's been brilliant. I had a good time. Hope everyone at home had a good time watching live or I think mostly listening in audio nowadays, which it's, yeah. it's kind of interesting uh, for a show that was created just for Patreons and we've done no advertisements for whatsoever. <laughs> but I've been Vin Stone. You can always hit me on the... Twitter nuts at Vinstone there and uh, just uh, Vinstone Google Plus. I'm also hanging there posting wacky, wacky things. <laughs> well, I don't post all the wacky, wacky things that Ven does, but if you want to English at me, you can. If you want to Portuguese at me, you can. If you want to Spanish at me, you can. And if you want to uh, French at me, you can too. You know, the language, not the kissing. Nori wouldn't approve of that, but I am an at Oh, great. What am I going to do with all this chapstick? <laughs> Sorry. And plus, Bitter Mateos on Google. Plus. And I am a magic model, and same thing. I mean, I, I don't think if I could handle Portuguese. You can always <laughs> uh, talk French or English, and mm. I will get back at you. Uh, also, check out on Lutris.net. Uh, lots of stuff going on there. And most of the stuff I post on my personal account is anyway related to Lutris. So, okay, Lutris uh, Patreon.com. Yeah, for yeah, I mean, trust me, that that was he was as excited as he's going to get. It's been brilliant. Mm, we'll see you next week. Bye. Aww, Bye. He waves. It was terrifying. It took a long time, though. <laughs> Uh, we, we got out of this one in 42 minutes, Shrugs. Okay, it took less long than I had originally uh, thought it would. 